This panel is uh, titled, Women's Rights Are Just Right. And uh, I'll just give you a little description. Many have contemplated whether the recent presidential election represented a rejection of women's equality. Some argue that the election revealed the United States veiled misogyny, while others believe the women's movement simply needs to change its focus and messages to garner broader appeal. So what is needed to inspire the grounds, groundswell support for a mainstream women's movement, and how can we encourage greater buy-in as well as expose the misogyny that lurks in our society? How does linking women's equality to racial equality strengthen both causes? So I'm here uh, this morning to introduce you and to participate on this panel. Uh, my name is Mignon Moore. I'm class of 92. I was a sociology major, and I became a sociology professor. Uh, right now, I am a professor at Barnard College. And I'm here to introduce first the participants. So I will introduce them formally, and then they will tell you something interesting about themselves as it relates to our time at Columbia. <laughs> Thought that would be a nice uh, icebreaker. So let me start with Andrea Miller, CC89. She is a nationally re recognized reproductive rights and women's health expert. In addition to helping to found the Center for Reproductive Rights, Miller is president of the National Institute for Reproductive Health and its Action Fund, which works on the state and local level to change public policy and normalize women's decisions on abortion and contraception. So maybe <laughs> Andrea will tell us <laughs> something about you know, her major or dorm or something interesting about Columbia. So I have a two-part fun fact. Um, the first part of the fun fact is that I was an editor at the Columbia Daily Spectator for a year and a half, um, first on the associate board and then on the regular board. Um, and one of my tasks, because I was editorial page editor, was to edit Neil Gorsuch's columns. Um, so that is the first, needless to say, he and I didn't really see eye to eye. Despite what I consider to be my tremendous journalistic integrity in printing that stuff, um, I nonetheless was kicked off of the Columbia Sp Daily Spectator in the fall of my senior year, after the fall, uh, in the fall of my senior year, because I refused to stop speaking out publicly on campus about issues that I thought were pressing and critical. And they felt that despite no evidence that I was biased and not representing the paper's views in the editorials, they felt it was an appearance of impropriety and therefore I had to go. <laughs> so I just founded a different paper and um, our first issue um, brought to light the fact that Columbia hadn't fully divested from investments in South Africa. So I felt like I kind of got the last you word. The <laughs> That's wonderful. I do remember that paper. Next we have Valerie Purdy Vons, now Valerie Greenaway. CC93. She is associate professor in the Department of Psychology here at Columbia, and she's also an instructor at the Columbia Business School. The author of more than 50 publications, she has been featured in numerous mainstream media outlets and has been awarded millions of dollars in federal research grants. <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> she wanted me to revise that, but I didn't. <laughs> Previously, uh, she was on the faculty at Yale and completed her doctoral work at Stanford. So do you have a fun fact? <laughs> uh, thank you. I was trying to figure out what fun facts I actually want to A, remember, and B, tell you. Um, but I think it's not exactly a fun fact, but I think what I want you all to know is that I graduated... Um, with a less than stellar average. I graduated from Columbia with about a 2.9, which is enough that your parents are like, hey, that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> but not you know, quite enough to, I think, merit what, what you think you see today. And, and I say that because we all have a story, you know, and you look at my CV and you say, you know, Columbia, Stanford, Yale, Columbia. But what I want you to know is that it was a journey. I did not do well at Columbia and I got here from just being really interested in a few particular research questions around identity that no one was studying at that time. So I say that because where you are now is just where you need to be. 
And where you're going to be 10, 15, 20 years from now is just where you need to be then. And there's nothing about where you are and what your grades are right now that define your possibility in the future. And that is a fun fact. <laughs> And we have Khadija Sharif Drinkard, uh, CC93. She is Vice President and Associate General Counsel for Viacom Media Networks and BET Networks. Previously, she was Vice President, Senior Counsel at Nickelodeon and developed Viacom's company-wide mentoring program and resource group for women. She has received numerous awards and is a contributing author to a book entitled Living Islam Out Loud, American Muslim Women Speak. Good morning and thank you. And like Val, actually, I'm not sure. I had a fun fact I really wanted to share. Because I, I wasn't actually sure whether or not like Dean Hecker would be in the room, and he is actually. So I was like, yeah. But um, no, but interestingly enough, I actually worked for President Sovereign um, when I was here. Um, and I spent a lot of time running errands. That's what they, well, that was some of the things we did, I'll just say. Um, and so, um, and one of the things that I actually enjoyed doing was actually going out of the secret passageways um, in Low Library, which I didn't know existed. So for those of you, I guess I'm not supposed to tell exactly where they are, but um, for those of you who are, the, the Low Library is actually very interesting. So I actually found um, a lot, I was oftentimes late back from the errands, I'll just say. And, um, and it was because I was exploring most of the time, though. So I enjoy that. Um, but I, I I would just say that, you know, in addition to um, coming to Columbia, uh, I actually came um, as a college student, but I spent a lot of time here actually as a high school student because I was in Dove Discovery Center, Ooh. which Dean Lehecka founded and Kevin Matthews was our director for. So they're both in the room. It's actually full circle, right? Um, so I spent a lot of time actually um, on this campus as a kid. Uh, going through, coming through the Victorian gates, sitting on South Lawn. My mom would bring like blankets for the picnic, you know, we would just sit you know, on the lawn and, and I would always look at Butler on one end and Lowe at the other and think to myself, who are these people, all the names at the top, Socrates, Plato, et cetera, on the other side, and just think that I belonged here from the beginning. So back to Valerie's point, um, as a long, young kid from the projects in Harlem, just nine blocks away, we would walk home with Kevin like every night from Double Discovery Center. He would walk us up to the 125th Street train station. He would go his way across the street. We would go a couple of blocks up. And every night, I will tell you, um, you know, those walks that we had, oftentimes it reminded me of where I was going to be in life, whether it be here or someplace else. But I always knew I belonged. So um, entering my first year at Columbia and those, sitting in those classes and talking about, you know, the core curriculum, I... It didn't really represent me, per se, as a little black kid from Harlem, but I knew that I was in the right space. And so um, if, you, if you ever doubt that you're where you're supposed to be, you are where you're supposed to be, like Val said. And I think that's actually really important to remember. All right. So I'd like to begin uh, by asking each person to share a little bit about the role Columbia played and helping you become a strong female leader, uh, how your experience here might have helped you find your voice, or maybe it didn't help you find your voice and you found it later, uh, but how uh, also your experience at Columbia College might have affected your choice of work today. I know for myself, I was a sociology major. I came here thinking I was going to uh, uh, be the CEO of a major company. That's what I wanted to do when I arrived. And then I took economics and I, I did not like economics. Me <laughs> and I had a uh, Gujarati, I guess, who was like the great econ economics professor, and I still didn't like it. And so I had to think of, had to think of something else. And I tried teaching, and uh, I just didn't fit so well uh, in, in the elementary school classroom. And eventually, I uh, had some professors that I really admired who were sociology professors, and I wanted to be like them. And that was how I started my journey in, into sociology. Um, but this uh, place uh, prepared me. It, it was a good major. You know, sociology was fine there. It's better now. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I just had the experience of coming in, wondering if I belonged, and then leaving feeling like I, I did belong, and I, and I had belonged. And so that set me up for uh, achieving greater things. So sometimes there's, there's a certain kind of growth that you experience, you know, we're learning, we're, we're growing in, in, in terms of education, but we're also growing into the women and men 
uh, that we're going to be. And so uh, being here and being able to do well here allowed me to see that, yes, I was good enough, it turns out. <laughs> and yes, I can do other things. So uh, um, I think that, that having the chance to participate in such a special place, uh, such a world-renowned place, can really help you uh, move on to other things. And so that was, that was how Columbia uh, helped set me up for, for the things I did later in life. Um, so I would say that uh, what was critical for me was that Columbia gave me opportunities both inside and outside the classroom that were both equally critical to my development. And um, I would say in some ways it's important for me that I would start sort of with the outside the classroom because when I was here, it was the late 80s. It was the second term of Ronald Reagan. It was, he w it was at the height of that sort of intense backlash at that moment. We'll talk about backlash more later, later I believe. But um, there were so many issues at play here on campus on Morningside Heights that were a microcosm of all the issues that, that were at play in the nation and in the world. It was apartheid, and it was our inv involvement in Central America. It was race and gender issues sort of coming to the fore. It was about fair wages. It was about you know rape culture. It was you know, whether we didn't know to call it rape culture. So all of these things were present. And there was so much activism and so much potential for activism here that gave me opportunities that I don't know that I would have had in other places. Um, I was actually, though, an international affairs major, um, thinking I was going to go do Soviet studies and that was going to be my future. That, obviously wasn't my future. Um, and what happened as I had started on the sort of international issues and economic justice issues as kind of my go-to as an activist, but my classroom work suddenly started to dovetail with new issues that were emerging for me around gender. Um, and that was where I think the real power came is that there was an intersection between those two. So as we were seeing a Supreme Court that was about to overturn Roe versus Wade, I had coursework where I was able to explore these questions, the law, the questions of privacy, the fact that it's not the most protective doctrine if you care about economic justice or racial justice, it's a fairly limited um, ruling. And so that was something that became really intriguing to me. And that set me on this course. And it was funny to look back because I never thought that I would be in a, what is essentially often a gendered space and considered sort of gender work. Um, because I came in thinking I was gonna do Soviet studies and that I was gonna go you know, negotiate treaties or something, I don't know. <laughs> So, so for me, uh, I, was a, I was an athlete, uh, and uh, I played women's varsity basketball, and honestly, that's what I did. Um, and uh, I say that because when I sort of think of how to answer this question, I think of sleeper effects. So in psychology, sleeper effects is the idea that things are sort of percolating at a non-conscious level, and then at some point uh, later in time, those they start to emerge. And so in, in, in sort of at, at its germinal stage, you don't actually know what's happening, but later on it actually happens. And it's used to, to study all kinds of things. And when I think of my experience at Columbia, it is all about sleeper effects. Because when I was here, things were happening that I actually wasn't participating in. So there was the Autobahn ballroom um, that was a huge contentious point where uh, many, not just African-American students, but all kinds of faculty and students want, did not want Columbia University to purchase it. And there were lots of protests that was going on. We also, many of the same things around the, the core curriculum were, were, so there were lots of challenges about the, the nature of the core curriculum and what it was. And I didn't participate in any of it. Um, the, what I remember most is, is playing basketball. Um, but what I now see later on are three things. One, and, and I'm not being paid to say this, but the core curriculum teaches you to mix it up with all kinds of people who you may not like, but you're going to sit in that classroom and engage with them for two hours every, several times a week. <laughs> And when, and then what happens is you go out in, into the world and you're like, I can mix it up with anybody, you know, and, and, and that is something that is now is, is incredibly powerful. Number, number two, and it is amazing that, that Kevin Matthews is sitting here and, and Dean LaHecka, 
the Double Discovery, I worked for Double Discovery, and you learn that your job as a Columbia citizen is to help other people. That these are not like just kids in Harlem. Like you have to do something because you're here. And so, and I, I learned that from Kevin was like, you know, we're not doing you, you know, you're not doing us a favor. We're doing you a favor because you're leaving Columbia a different person because of us. And I was like, oh. <laughs> You know, it's 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 like rever it's it's reverse mentoring, and you and 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 I learned, and and I didn't I didn't think I learned anything. I was just trying to make some money over the summer, but but now I see that that's incredibly powerful. And then the last thing for from the sports is compete, compete, compete. Columbia, you know, at particularly at the time, you know, wasn't the best at winning. You know, we've had our sort of challenges with that. Um, <laughs> But what you learn is that, you know, you just, you have to be able to compete athletically and then like, you know, be on the bus taking a final and then come back and get back into the classroom. So all of those things, which I, I, I didn't think mattered at all, I now use every day as, as a scientist and a researcher. That's great. What I would say actually is that I actually, um, I, I would probably say that I was most fond, of, although the core, I agree with Val, there were moments, you know, when I sat in those classes for CC and Lit Hum and I was like, wow. Um, you know, is anything in this course going to reflect me? But what I did love is that we had the ability to take other classes, too, that actually had professors like Catherine Newman, who was my anthropology professor, who, when I never forget when I read the book, The, um, the Other America by Michael Harrington, it was this invisible land that he talked about that he didn't quite understand. And, and that, in, in some ways, actually, it spoke true to sort of Columbia in itself and just the very situation of not just the Audubon in some ways, but also just me being from Harlem and understanding sort of what some of the, the baggage was, if you will, for Harlem residents who came to Columbia, who heard about Columbia and all those other things. Um, but it gave me a place in a, in a space to express myself in, in papers, in dialogue, in the classroom, um, discussing with Dennis Dalton, who was a professor at Barnard, who was amazing on the political science side as well, and he would let me juxtapose Plato against Dr. King and say, you know, so how do we compare these two, these two documents? You know, what is it to be, what is the republic actually really? What does it really look like? And Dr. King's, where do we go from here? And stride towards freedom. I could actually express myself. I could bring all of who I was to the forefront. I didn't have to leave anything at the doorstep. And I think Columbia, what it taught me in that respect was that when I got to corporate America, quite honestly, I was leaving nothing at the doorstep. I was bringing it all with me. You wouldn't get all of Khadijah, whether you liked it or not. Um, I see Dean LaHecka and Kevin nodding their heads going, oh yeah, right. <laughs> they are like, yeah, right. Um, but, but, but I say that because, you know, so often we leave pieces of ourselves other places because we don't think they fit or they belong. And the thing that I learn, and I teach my kids this all the time, whoever you are, whatever it is, quite honestly, the courage that we have to bring who we are to the forefront and to the space that we sit in, whether it be, I'm sitting on a, a, some, a lot of times I do a lot of work with women at my company, um, particularly in the space of executive development. And a lot of times women don't, don't bring all of who they are. They don't think it fits. So the, some of those skill sets, though, are actually things that will actually make us more successful. So we have to be able to have the confidence to bring who we are, you know, and also leave space for other people to bring who they are as well. I would say that as well. And, and you know, the core for me, actually, I actually appreciated the core after I left Columbia way more than I did when I was here. You know, I have to say, because I actually was talking, all these events, I'm at these events, somebody's going to Columbia, they're like, oh, what about the core? It's a unique and an interesting way to bind people together quickly. But the most important thing, too, is that we go, I read all those books all over again. I went back, the Iliad, the Odyssey, all these books, and I was like, and later on, it meant so much more to me. And so I do think that, you know, talking about things percolating and not really knowing, right? When you look at sort of how all this plays, when I'm in a, a meeting at work and someone says, oh, you know about that book? Oh, absolutely, of course I do. I read that book when I was 17 years old. <laughs> I'm like, right. You know, like, really, you know what I mean? So I do think that it, 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 it's a way to unify people, but it's also a way to tell people, yeah, I've arrived also, quite honestly, <laughs> and that we can have a discussion in a whole different way, and let's not dumb it down for me because we can raise it up because I'm actually where you are, or maybe even beyond it. And not in a negative way, but more so to say, particularly as women, because you heard Clea and you heard Wanda talk about confidence. And that is the thing that we as women in particular, looking at 30 years later at Columbia, if we don't have anything else, 
that we walk away with today, we have to figure out how do we make sure that we, in, we utilize our confidence um, and grow our confidence, not just for little kids, because, you know, I have an 11-year-old in the audience, actually. But I will tell you, this is the, these are the same challenges that we have as women, as women in corporate America, as women in academics, as women um, in sports. We, we need to be able to figure some of these things out. And I do think that, you know, having an environment such as Columbia, for those of you who are still students here, I would say, don't be afraid. Get involved. I was on BSO. I used to be with Dean LaHecka <laughs> all the time. I was protesting. I was, but I knew when to go home because I wasn't getting expelled. <laughs> I almost did. Yeah, right. I knew when to go home. So I would just say, get involved, don't be afraid, and make sure that, you know, as you're engaged, you're also leaving space for other people to bring who they are. I think that's really important. So this is a great panel. Sorry. That was only my I first question. I wasn't going to get expelled. I, I knew I was here. I was going to get expelled. <laughs> The loss um, by Hillary Rodham Clinton, the first woman nominated for president by a major party, was disappointing for many. Also difficult to experience was the barrage of misogynistic comments throughout the campaign and election. Comments about women's and young girls' bodies, about women's intellect, hypocrisies in news reporting that ignored sexist language and actions, or perpetuated double standards in reporting. The list goes on and on. Andrea. Uh, given your work in the policy field and in politics, I'm curious about your perspective on the campaign and how women were portrayed and evaluated and what this collective experience we had and are still having says about where our society stands in, view, in its view of women. So I'm trying to try not to be too much of a Debbie Downer on this one, but I mean, look, misogyny, absolutely. You could not have gone through this election cycle or the previous election cycles without seeing it, understanding it was there, and knowing that it was having a big impact on the way that everyone viewed the Hillary, Cl Hil Hillary uh, Secretary Clinton. Um, this was truly a backlash election, but I think we would be really remiss if we assumed that it was all about gender. Uh, it was definitely about gender, it, but it's a both and, or a multiple and, because frankly, I would argue it was more about race than it was about gender, and about who belongs here and who doesn't. And about, I mean, some of it you could call dog whistle politics, where they sort of signal, but frankly, there was no dog whistle. It was like a blaring horn. Um, and then there was also the fact that this was about jobs in the economy because it is always about jobs in the economy. Every single election you can go back, you can track it. Number one issue, jobs in the economy, except during the Cold War when it was the war. Um, so it was really a perfect storm of all of those factors. I think though what's most striking is that the misogyny as well as the racism was not disqualifying. That, to me, is the most striking part. It was not disqualifying, right? And particularly, I think, and I, I've thought a lot about this and had a lot of conversations um, with my various sisters in this movement and beyond since the elections, particularly noteworthy that it was not disqualifying among a majority of white women in this country, okay? So that says a lot about what we as white women need to do to be thinking about how we're showing up in this space. I mean, the fact of the matter is women of color showed up in this election just like they always do for themselves, for their families, for their communities, and for all the rest of us, I would, I would argue. And we do not show up in the ways we need to. So I think that is part of why we have these continued struggles. And to me, that's the biggest lesson and also the biggest opportunity that comes for to us in the wake of this election. Um, I think the other is, I think it's an important reminder that there isn't a universal experience of being a woman in this country. And the more we can understand that complexity, I think the better space we open up to be able to engage, to understand, and to be able to attack that deep-seated misogyny. I'll say the last thing is, frankly, at least it's out in the open now. There is something to that. There's a power to that. And we cannot underestimate the power of, that we can use that to try to change that. Um, I guess my final point is, 
do not take away from this election that it was a repudiation of moving forward on women's rights or moving forward on race relations or moving forward on abortion and contraception and the work that I do day in and day out. Because if you ask people, we did focus groups um, even among Trump supporters right after the election. And we laid out what we knew was going to be the agenda for the new administration, which they were really honest about. And they were like, you sure? I thought they were going to do this jobs thing. We're like, eh, I don't think so. I think you're going to lose your health care. I think you're going to lose your access to contraception. I think they're going to try to defund Planned Parenthood. I'm just saying. That's kind of what they've been saying. And they're like, really? I thought they were going to do this jobs thing. Why is that going to be the priority? Because they've been saying that's a priority. Well, that's not what I voted for. So you're like, well, wish you'd gotten that, picked up that clue phone before November 8th, but okay, pick it up now. So, and that was among both, that was white women and white men who voted for Trump. Okay, so I think it's important to remember that means that there's, there's a lot more possibility out there. I think back to the points that my wonderful colleagues on this panel are making, it reminds us we should be remembering to talk to those who are not always like us because they may not actually have voted for what you think they voted for. Can I just ask you a, a little bit more about that before we turn to yeah. the other panelists? Because I just cannot understand how, how those voters would not have understood what they were voting for. Because these are not, I mean, we'd like to think of these people as unlearned people or uh, people who don't associate in other in different parts of society, but these are people who have a range of education and 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 and, and professional backgrounds. So how is it that they didn't know? I think it isn't that they didn't know. I think it's that there was there were other things that were were more pressing that mattered more to them. Particularly, and again, I think there's a gender dynamic to this. The Clinton baggage, which includes gender dynamic, but not just gender dynamic. And the, the fact that every single one of the voters that we talked to were like, we just, he was, he was saying things to mix things up. And he's not a politician. When politicians say that, we'd really believe it. But when he's saying it, he's just saying it to blow things up. We're like, eh, I think that was a risk you probably shouldn't have taken. Um, that was a gamble, not a good one to make. So I, I think that they heard it. I don't think they truly believed it, if that makes sense. But, and yet, it's still when there he would think that just hearing it would make it disqualifying for more people. And that that is troubling. It's deeply, deeply disturbing. It's not just troubling. But I think that they really were so fixated on being sick and tired of politicians, quote unquote, every single one of them. And then the next thing was jobs. And then, yeah, there's all that other. But it was it, I think it was those two things that overrode everything else for those voters. I mean, obviously not for everyone, but for those voters, yes. Um, outside of that swath of those who truly did vote the way they did because they don't think women should be equal. They don't believe in racial equality. They don't think that we should allow people in our border, across our borders and all of those things. So there were certainly some of those, but it wasn't uniform. Mm -hmm. I actually, I have a question actually. So I, I'm sorry to me, y'all. It's like, oh yeah, no. That's cool. But I actually was struck by, I guess, a lot of the media coverage of people who compartmentalize mm -hmm. what Trump said and did, and I'm, um, and really kind of just sort of said, yeah, but that I didn't focus on that. Like that wasn't the thing I was focused on, to the point that you know whether it be the bully Bush tape or the this tape or whatever, you know, and I was struck by the fact that all these women, quite honestly, particularly actually you know, we're used to, in some ways, I want to say a little bit, I want to say abuse, actually. Yeah. I want to say abuse. I want to call it abuse. Yeah. Because I don't know how else to point it at this point, right? Who were, who were used to abuse in their own communities, if you will, and said, we always hear that. They always yeah. say that about us. Yeah. And I, you know, for those of us who had hair standing up on our arms when we watched the morning news and going, that didn't just happen, did it? Oh my gosh, it's, it's over, you know, right? Yeah, or, exactly. Well, that's you think, that's it, that's straw, it, right? right? And then it's like, no, actually, no, no, that's fine. Wait, he's up, actually. <laughs> you know, so I actually, I don't, I still don't quite understand. Um, and, I, and obviously the numbers speak for themselves, but I don't fully understand sort of the, and maybe I'm trying to understand something that actually I just can't relate to. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the challenge that I have. But the, the compartment, compartmentalization, I should say, of some people and their understanding as to what he represented mm -hmm. for America, right? Granted, if it was, you know, something that they, they that was he was you know that he was actually espousing that they felt that he was um, going to come through with that was working for them that's one thing but I don't necessarily think that most people voted because of that actually that they really thought that they I think if anything in my opinion 
going back to your point about the blaring bullhorn, it was like, guess what? You all, you all are on top again. Um, mm-hmm. You deserve to be here, right. and everybody else doesn't. And by the way, whatever he says or does, I'm okay with because he told me that I matter again. And I was really struck by that level of, um, I think, anger in some ways, oh, yeah. but also um, the the willingness to be abused mm-hmm. in order to get something. And I don't think people got what they thought they were going to get. So. I have a question. Tell me y'all have a question. Yeah. That's going to... I was trying to figure out with Munoz. I think Munoz was either my RA or sister, older sister, so I'm trying to keep the high. Look, we're thing. not that far apart. And she used to live. <laughs> I was one year ahead of her. I was so young and she was so old. <laughs> well, I was actually going to ask you, Valerie, uh, about your research because in your re- in part of your research, you study implicit bias. Mm-hmm. And you suggest ways to reverse the impact of bias. So in thinking about women across race and class and thinking about An- Andrea's comments, what are some of the most dangerous biases mm. that you've observed that weaken our chances of advancement? Do you have suggestions for how women and men can reverse these trends and improve the prospects mm. for equity and fairness? Uh, or are there places where we've seen concrete gains for women that might be obscured in this current political mm. climate? Um. Um, so, you know, the, it's a really interesting question um, because I read the news like everyone else, but my wheelhouse is, is what the science tells us. And there's a, there's a, I'm not sure, there's a couple different uh, entry pieces. One entry piece is, you know, what we saw in terms of the degree of sexism that, that Clinton experienced is just lock, stock, and barrel, what you could, you could predict uh, uh, in particular vis-a-vis the science. This, this idea that, you know, she has a uh, double bind, that when she appears to be competent, then both women and men, you know, see her as sort of, you know, kind of bitchy. And then when she is feminine, then they see her as weak. And so this is a classic double bind. It's not even interesting. It was studied in the 80s. You can like, you know, and so I'm just like, oh, that looks like, I'm like, why is she wearing that pink suit? We know what's going to happen the next day. So, so, you know, when you, when you look at what the science tells us, um, you know, it, it, it was really just, you know, lock, stop, sci- lock, uh, barrel science uh, on full display. So, that, so that's one thing. The, the other thing related to the, the voting in particular white women is also something that science tells us. So even though there are so many ad- advances uh, around uh, women, women's attitudes, men and women's attitudes, um, Um, uh, attitudes just towards gender and identity, what you still see is that women oftentimes hold the strongest stereotypes about women. And you see this in the classroom and you see this in the corporation. And there's some really great studies, great because I mean they're experimentally clean, showing that oftentimes older women are the worst mentors for younger women. Um, So still be nice to the alums. Um, but, but, and, and the idea is, is that, uh, is that if you have sort of gone through the fire, then your, your sort of ideology is that the, the people younger, you know, you need to sweat some. And, and the irony is that sometimes uh, older men are actually better yet mentors for younger women than, than older women. And so it's like a bifurcated effect. Some, you see this among some women, you see this among, uh, uh, you don't see this among others, but it's not clear what the cutting variable is. And I say that because we have to be really honest about what we see in terms of the effects of stereotyping and implicit bias and say it's not always rah-rah women. There's, there's no surprise. That was no surprise that you would see um, uh, uh, what we saw in particular for white women. The last thing that I'll say is that there's some also really interesting, there, there, up until about maybe 10 years ago, there really wasn't any interesting research on black women except for all the ways in which we can't take care of our children and blah, blah, blah. Um, which now that I have a nine-year-old, I'm like, mm, some of it, <laughs> no, if I can't take care of this child, <laughs> I need some help. <laughs> um, so, that's another panel. Um, so, but, but what I will say, there's some really interesting research showing that when you look at the experience of, of, of African-American women, they actually oftentimes have more leader, and women of color more generally have more leadership skills 
compared to, to white women, but the problem is it's not counted as leadership. So you might see it through the church, you might see it through these, these sort of like non-traditional uh, pathways. And, the, and what, that, how, what happens is people are sort of surprised when women of, of color sort of emerge as leaders and they're not seen as sort of the natural sort of next step to men. There's like this really interesting hierarchy. It's sort of white men, white women, uh, men of color, and then women of color. But that's not what the data uh, tells us. And so I think that there's a way in which being really sort of uh, not, not sort of beholden to science, but just pay attention to what science tells tells us because it's a lot more complicated, these stories around gender. Mm -hmm. So how do you think, uh, how do you think, what could we have done differently with regard to understanding science? Now I'm talking to a room of people who believe in science, so I mean, that's one thing <laughs> that's different, but how, how do you think we can uh, use science and all the kind of brainiac things and, and intellectual things that, that we all um, promote and, and help grow in in other places where people might not have much experience with it or might tend to be a little more suspicious of it. Mm -hmm. How do we and, and this is just a you know a, a broader question for, for all of us. How do we how do we take that information and make it accessible mm -hmm. to others who are outside of these walls or do who don't have experience here in ways that are persuasive, you mm -hmm. know? So I remember talking to my, my, my co uh, not talking, because we use social media, my cousins down south, uh, young men who work in a factory, and they were like, you know, and, and they were in South Carolina, and I was talking to them about the need to uh, get their, their people out to vote, and they were telling me they were gonna vote, but then, you know, they would make a, 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 an update, but then at the end they'd say, but Hillary, how about those emails, <laughs> right? And so, how do I, you know, I try to make my most persuasive case to them, and, and I thought it was persuasive, and then he still wrote that at the end of his post. So, so how do we connect to yeah. people who are not, who don't have this experience? Yeah. Um, there, I think there's sort of two pieces of it. Uh, one is I think that uh, we who call about, call ourselves card carrying scientists are quite terrible at connecting with the public. We're like, you know, we have a really long paper that's 50 pages and we want to connect with the public so we're going to make it 25 pages. <laughs> and then that way everybody's going to understand what we have to say. <laughs> and so, and then we're going to email it in 10 point font. You know, and it's like, you just, you know, there, there is an entire um, way in which scientists need to grow in terms of how we connect um, both in terms of the mechanism, Twitter and, and so forth, but also in literally in terms of the way we write. That's sort of one one piece. The, the other piece, and this might be a little bit controversial, but the other piece is that one of the things that we're learning is that this sort of liberal conservative continuum is not just about political ideology. There's a lot of deep rooted psychology in it. So for instance, there's some interesting research around racial health disparities that say, you know, conservatives actually literally don't respond to the word disparities. That's just not a word that, that resonates with them. So why are we writing health disparities as liberals when we're sending policy reports to Washington? It just doesn't make any sense. And so one way to think about it is write the word disparities bigger, right? <laughs> and say they need to get with the program. But another way is if we uh, can attune to sort of understanding the way, it's, it's not about intelligence or dumbing it down or using a different grade level for the vocabulary. I believe it's about understanding a little bit more the ways in which people are understanding what do they mean by jobs? What do they mean by, I want to get ahead? What are they, you know, and, and if we can sort of, I'm not saying scientists are good at it, but to the extent that we can use that intellectual project, I, I think we could be more successful both in the next election, but just also in conversations. And so um, that's just my perspective. There, there might be other perspectives, but that, that's, that's how I think about it. We, we, Mignon is not saying this, but we actually live uh, upstairs. We used to live upstairs from each other, right across the street, uh, as as faculty members and housing. Although we we want bigger apartments, um, <laughs> but but we, we have very different views because I, I I'm sort of like a oftentimes I'm like you know let's try to sort of bridge, but I I recognize that that might be, you know. There's a time. There's a yeah. time for yeah. bridging. There's yeah. a time for other things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, uh, what, I want to shift gears a little bit uh, to um, to talk to you, Andrea, because you've spent years working as an advocate 
to activate support for reproductive rights. What have you learned from that work that could help in rethinking how the greater feminist movement might need to ca calibrate, uh, recalibrate its approach for a greater impact? So I guess it's not quite switching gears, but thinking about reproductive rights. Um, so I think that, that when I was thinking about this panel um, and thinking back to my time here and sort of my awakening around the importance and centrality of women being able to control our reproductive lives in order to control our destinies and, and, our and, and shape our families and shape our futures, I realized that that place was not the place I started. And I think in some ways that's both important for me personally as, a, as moving into leadership in this movement, but also for the movement writ large. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So my entree point was, oh my God, Roe versus Wade is gonna be overturned. I am, you know, a scholarship kid from, you know, a poor neighborhood in the Midwest who watched her single mo single parent mother struggle, uh, you know, not be able to sometimes have furniture or, you know, the right food on the table or all of these things because, mostly because of her reproductive decisions, because she had me. And that's completely changed the course of her life. And then she had two more kids and she was, so my sort of fear was like about, oh my God, that one thing can completely derail your entire life. That was sort of how I entered it. And it was truly terrifying to me, but it made it so specific to this one decision and this one aspect of women's lives. And that was really narrow. And I think I started very narrow. And I think sometimes the, the movements of which I am a part um, can sometimes get a little too stuck on that really narrow piece. And over time, what I've learned is how important it is to look at this issue from the lens of different people at different points in their lives, different women at different points in their lives, and what they need to be able to make the decisions that are best for them and what kinds of supports we as a society need to ensure we're providing, whether that be accessible, affordable abortion in your community, or making sure that childcare is available, making sure that you have a living wage, making sure that you're, you have a good place to live where you're, you know, there's a place for, for your kids to be safe, that they can walk down the street and not fear being harassed or shot. Um, that, so I think that, that what that has said to me is that we need and can be thinking about even these issues that seem to be talked about in isolation as a more holistic and intersectional conversation. And again, I think I, I loved your point about things that finally kind of come to you after, after a while. And I actually do think my experience at Columbia meant that that was in the back of my brain, even if that fear factor was in the front of my brain. And over time, I think that's sort of been infused. And for the movement overall, the other piece I think is really important is that I've learned over time, and I started working mostly at the national level, and I now work for an organization whose primary focus is to work at the state and local level and to work with the organizations and the people who are on the ground in their communities who understand their needs, who understand what has to happen, and who have the kind of leadership that isn't always recognized and lifted up. Um, and so I think for the movement, the other piece that I've learned in addition to how we understand these issues and how we work on them, in a broader way, in a more intersectional and cross-movement way, is also that we gotta stop being fixated only on what happens at the federal level in Washington, D.C., and relying only on the courts as our backstop, right? Because we, by the way, have been losing through that system of, of focus. And so I think that the other piece that I have learned and is that working really del intentionally at the state and local level and thinking about the fact that that provides, I mean, think about your experience here at Columbia in this community. Think about the ability as a student on campus to talk across different issue sets. If you're involved in whatever it is you're involved in on campus, you happen to be in a dorm with someone who's involved in something very different. Because you're in a microcosm, you can have that dialogue. And that's what you can do at the state and local level in ways that you really can't at the federal level in the same way. The access is different, right? Who has access in those spaces and who doesn't? And I think particularly now, we are seeing a moment where others are starting to recognize that. And I think some of the groundswell that has happened post-election we need to hear that and recognize that that needs to be where we're going and that needs to be where we're investing our time and supporting the lifting up of the leadership that exists at the local level but that we often don't, don't recognize 
and don't support and don't salute. So, mm -hmm. uh, speaking about leadership, uh, Khadija, I know that you mentioned earlier that you do some, you have done some important work in uh, in in the companies that you've uh, been associated with and uh, advocating for women leaders in the workplace. And I wanted to know more about that. And I'm particularly interested in how that relates to ch children and having children and how you negotiate these little critters with your, you know, <laughs> your uh, ambition, with your own ambition. Uh, the timing of when when you bring children into if you bring children into your lives when you do and and how that affects your uh, climb your ascension into leadership and and I was wondering if you could say anything about about how you uh, help uh, mentor others in that respect. Sure. So as the young mentioned, I actually have been at Viacom for about I want to say twenty years. I left for a little bit to travel and write, and then came back. And, um, you know, when I came back, actually, uh, one of the, the women who she actually runs um, the Office of Global Inclusion uh, asked me at the inaugurate, the second inauguration, if I could help them really kind of launch this women's, um, e we call it ERG, it's actually Employee Resource Group or an Affinity Group is what they used to call it. But I think going back to Valerie's point, you know, terminology is everything. And if you start calling things Affinity Group, sometimes people are like, Ooh, maybe not, you know, that's like passe. So we say Employee Resource Groups because these groups are supposed to provide resources to employees and also obviously to help further the company's mission in some way. So I was asked to launch a women's ERG, and I did, and I pitched it to the CEO of ICOM at that time and his in the board of um, people in the global inclusion space. And I was actually shocked that the people who didn't want the women's ERG to exist were women. I was like, really? So what was so shocking about that was that they, and I, I wanted to inquire more about it because it, it took us a long, it was actually the last ERG ever developed at Viacom. And we tried for a long time and they said no. And, and basically women said, if we have an ERG, it proves that we haven't arrived yet, that we still need help and that we don't want any special treatment. I was like, really? Because there's a black ERG, there's an Asian Pacific ERG, there's a um, um, LGBT ERG, there's an ERG for everything else. I mean, so what is the problem with women saying we want to come together, we want to connect, we want to have, we want to speak our own language? We talked about that, right? We want to speak, we want to talk to each other sometimes. And we really need a safe space by which we could come and have discussions that would not be taken back to other people necessarily, but just so, you know, those questions like, you know, so I'm dealing with this with my supervisor maybe, or I have a colleague who thinks he assumes that he's going to get that promotion and we're, you know, competing, 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 we're fighting. Um, what are the tricks I need? How do I get it, go about this? Um, I have a millennial I'm trying to work with, through some of the issues with because, you know, we're learning how to work with people from very, very different generations at times and, you know, their different values, if you will, um, that, that germinate at different times for different groups. And so we really were focused on um, getting this ERG, and we did actually, and I chaired it for five years. And I will say that um, we talked a lot of important issues. I mean, confidence, actually, I brought a woman in. I tried to get Claire Shipman, but Claire was really busy. But, um, but we did have, <laughs> she's great, though. But we did have some other women who came in to talk about confidence. And, and confidence actually was the number one thing that we realized that we needed to work on as women. We knew this from research that I had been in the leadership program before. People had also been in that leadership program. And we learned this from some years ago. But what I would say is that... Um, what was clear to me was that not only were women holding themselves back, they were holding other women back. And it was scary because the very thing that Val's research reveals, in essence, is that there are people who assume that if they had a really difficult time, you should have an equally difficult time, if not worse. So you talk about hazing in some ways. It was very difficult. So I actually had a lot of white male mentors. I'll just be honest with you. I was like, you know, I don't really have time for this. There was a, you know, and I'll just say, no, and I'm just saying because sometimes those are the people who were saying, you know, Khadija, you have talent, you have potential. This, here's an assignment. Here's a stretch assignment. Take this, take that. So I was that, I just wanted to work. I just wanted to learn the skill set. I wanted to master it. I wanted to be good. I wanted to be great. So I didn't really have time for all the other stuff. And what I recognized was that there was all these other things that women had that we had to jump through hoops for and all this other stuff and kiss the ring. And I didn't have time for kissing the ring. Um, <laughs> But but these are the these are but these are the things that we have to deal with one day. So you just want to come to your job, 
You you have all this other baggage that you, so, you know, if you're the only person of color in the room, somebody else comes in the room, a person of color, then it's like, people get upset. It's like, really? Can't we just all, like, don't we, isn't this what we want? Right? But we also had challenges, and I'll say, um, you know, in addition to sort of developing and helping women get through these, these are real issues that people are dealing with. So this is what we talked about in our sessions. We dealt with real things, and we, whatever happened in the room didn't leave the room. So that was the, and we still do this. We have a code of honor. We did everything from lean in, and then we challenged lean in to say, well, if we lean in too far, do you topple over, or do you really, do, I mean, because some people did. So people got slapped, you know, you have to really kind of figure out exactly the right, the right tone and timing for everything. So we, we, we tried to help our colleagues figure some of these things out. I will say in my own career, like I waited six years to have kids, not because I thought that I would be, at least not consciously, I didn't think that I would be disaffected, you know, sort of, I should say, um, um, treated unfairly if I got pregnant too early. But I will say that I was conscious in, in knowing that a lot of times companies feel like your best years are these years and they want to see you working, working, working to some extent. So maybe, you know, unconsciously that was something that I was working through to try to get to a certain level before I got, you know, pregnant. But I will say there are a lot of women who, um, these are real challenges for them. They're, this, these are real, like, real life issues that they bring to the workplace that they have to try to work through. And, you know, while I have spent a lot of my time talking to women and helping women navigate some of these issues, you know, there's something, there's something that we have to do, I would say, as a society, really, too, because the messaging and the and, and the 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 media in a lot of ways we're, we're getting messages about how we're supposed to behave if you will because mm -hmm. even in corporate america so you know the good girl doesn't get the corner office kind of thing mm -hmm. well we we figure that out too actually um, mm -hmm. um so i would say that from the perspective of helping women to try to navigate helping women navigate these spaces it's a difficult thing and i think it's ongoing i think the work is something that we haven't mastered yet mm -hmm. and I would tell you that you know we're nowhere near where we where we need to be mm -hmm. but I I do think that many people are open to having these conversations about the challenges that we have and even the implicit bias that exists um, which companies have gotten more tuned to now and are now having all these consultants come in and say there's implicit bias and if you breathe you have bias all mm -hmm. of us have bias in some way right. if you if you if you are a person who is still alive you're biased we <laughs> all are I mean it's the reality well uh, that was a lot for me to, uh, I would not be able to respond to everything she said. I, I would just say, yes, you can wait to have your children, but don't wait too later. You might have old eggs. <laughs> that was my problem, old eggs. <laughs> but I still uh, achieved motherhood. Uh, so that is something to, to weigh on the other side. I think sometimes we just assume when we're ready, we're going to have them and might not work out in that way anyway. Uh, but I do want to open up to questions for things we've been talking about or topics perhaps that we didn't get to talk about. Um, so, uh, yes. Excuse me. Oh, uh, Andrea, this was struck by something that you said, but I think it's a question that applies to all of you. We've seen, like, women... Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen women... One of the themes today is how women can be on each other's team and not compete against each other. And I think this is something we're seeing in the women's rights movement right now, we saw the backlash with Bernie campaigning for a pro, more pro-life Dem. We saw the issues around the Women's March with the pro-Palestinian stance and intersectionality. Can you guys speak to a little bit, I'd be curious to hear your perspectives about how we all try and advance these things that I think the majority of us believe in without ganging up on each other um, and advancing causes that we also all believe in at the same time that may not be directly related. Okay, I want to take uh, three questions and then have the panelists respond, just so that we get a sense of the different topics that are of interest in the room. So yes. Um, so I had this question from our previous conversation as well, which is talking about how we come through a system that empowers us, like Columbia, to its extent, or an all-girls school, for example. How do we then reconcile that with what we're not doing for boys' education around how they then treat us in the workplace. So if we go to an all-girls school, we may come out of it on top. I felt like I did at Columbia and my colleagues as well, but then you hit the workplace and all of a sudden the game changes. We said, you know, it's not grade school anymore. Now how you dress matters, people sexualize you when you never expected them to. So what can we be doing about 
from the grassroots level, from raising up boys, too, like, they need to know more about how they're allowed to treat us or not allowed to treat us. And, like, you know, this, like, internalized oppression that we have about allowing that behavior, like, what can we be doing for that particular cause? We've talked about rape culture. Like, this needs to be addressed on all the levels. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one more. Yes. I was struck by something you said. You said, I just wanted to do the work. And I feel the same way. And as you increase your leadership um, roles in the organizations where you spend time, as I have, I feel increasingly a responsibility to also mentor. And I wonder, especially women, but not only women, young men as well, I wonder how you toggle between just doing the work and mentoring and how you, um, I was particularly struck by what you said, but this is a question to all the panelists, how, how one really can be a leader, but just also just do the work. Because sometimes the best example is just doing the work and doing it better than anyone else in the room. And so I was really struck by what you said. Thank you. Three really important uh, questions. I'll ask the panelists to respond and to try to be brief, because I think we are just about out of time. But I do want us to try to address each of those points. Um, I'll be really quick. So I would just say that um, because of my own challenge that I had in terms of define, finding mentors that look like me in some ways, I was really conscious to mentor people, um, particularly on my team, um, but also people who are not on my team. I do think that doing the work, actually helping people learn how to do the work as well um, is really important. Lead leadership is really key, particularly because um, I'll just say that there's a great book called Our Separate Ways that you should look look up actually. It sort of talks about the sometime the dichotomy between to be honest, women of color and women um, who are not of color per se, but um, and all the other things that come along with that um, in terms of leading and growing it. But I actually make it a point to mentor people every single day on my team and other people as well and doing the work at the same time. It is really important and the truth is that um, if we spend the time developing other people and showing them that actually there is someone who looks like them or someone who doesn't look like them, quite honestly, who's willing to invest in them, it actually makes a big difference. They become great leaders as well. And I've actually seen that. So doing the work actually inherently includes being a good leader, in my opinion, and not really adding all the extra stuff that we don't really need to be dealing with in the workplace. I, can, I think I can address the, the second question, which is how do we, and, and fix it up if I'm, if I'm incorrect, how do we sort of reconcile all of the empowerment that, that, that we have sort of, you know, growing up developmentally and then, you know, how some women can be treated, you know, in, in the workplace going forward and specifically what, what, what can we do at the grass levels in terms of raising young boys? And what, what I will say is that when we think of gender, particularly today, oftentimes we still think of women and and we really need to have a serious meditation on male sexuality and to the extent that if we can't open up the ways in which boys can be boys whether it's the kinds of things that they play with the types of friendships that they have the sort of moving away from sports if we can't sort of loosen the reins on what it what boys think of when they think of themselves, particularly as young children, you know, sort of really introducing at the early age the fluidity of gender. I mean, this still like makes people uncomfortable. And until we sort of open up these these conversations about transgender, LGBT issues, and 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 specifically, I, I think focusing boys on an, ex, an extended range of being masculine. Um, we're really not going to get anywhere because it's the, it's sort of it's it's not just two sides. It's sort of this really sort of complex interplay. And the more you constrain boys and then say girls can do any anything, it kind of it, it sort of plays itself out in the in the workplace. And so that is where I think we really need. If if I were going to focus my time, that that's a lot of what what I would think of because the messages are still are there. You know, you have girls that are superheroes and flying around in capes and stuff, but but the but the boys are still they, they still have a very constrained strained range around masculinity there's only two or three degrees of freedom and so that that's where I personally think we need to think about um, I'll just try to get to the first question and I would say I think one of the things the first you mentioned the march and uh, the women's march or the women's marches I mean let's face it there were a million people in the streets in New York and DC and 600 plus marches all across this country and around the globe that is remarkable 
and yet, and, and yet what we remember is, oh, there was controversy about some of these things that they said in their agenda, right? I think that the proof is really in who t how many people turned out and the fact that that was seen as you didn't have to sign on to every single thing, but you could understand and appreciate that these things are interconnected. And, and I think that, to me, is really the, the path forward to say rather than being always in the kind of short-term game sort of, you know, okay, who's going to be the one issue, who's going to be the one movement that's going to get the thing this year, right? I mean, anytime you work in a state legislature, anytime you work in Congress, anytime you work with anybody in government, it's like there's a limited finite, it's as though there's a limited finite number of things that are good, that can happen, and you all have to negotiate out who gets to be that one or that two that year. That is a really narrow, short term, like the pie isn't big enough, we can only get a little piece kind of way of doing business in, in advocacy, and that's really hurt us. I think what the march showed us is we all are going to have the things that we're going to prioritize, but if we can recognize and appreciate that we're all playing the long game, that we actually together, what we want to get to is what we all are working on, and then you can have a different conversation about negotiating out, how do we show up for you, let's be realistic about what your chances are this year or next year, and, and what can we do to enhance your chances, and let's be honest about who really is about to get across the finish line, and how do we do that while helping the others get across the finish line, maybe not at exactly the same time, but, but soon, so that it isn't that like there's the one or two things, and everyone has to prioritize them, and all other things have to fall by the wayside. And I think that's been an unfortunate reality of, of even, you look at the organizations, you sort of look at the kind of professional class that does advocacy, and it really has, that has been sort of the, the approach. And I'm hopeful that because the marches were not top down, right? They were bottom up. Plenty of problems in the beginning. We really struggled with even how to sign on and when to sign on because of who was at the table and the fact that women of color were not at the table at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but the fact is, it was one of the most powerful moments and it hasn't stopped, mm -hmm. right? It hasn't stopped and it hasn't just been about women. It's been about healthcare, it's been about immigration, it's been about racial justice, it's been about you know more people showing up for Black Lives Matter. I think, again, the zero-sum game, the notion that it can only be one thing that you care about and do devote your time to, that's done us a disservice. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, I actually see hope right now because of what you're seeing and that people are showing up for each other in new ways. Well, it's nice for us to end on hope. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for participating and thank the panelists for their time.